All right, looks like we are on and ready to go. I will, a couple minutes early, so gonna wait for people to join. Uh, I'm just gonna text some of the group members now. And so I will leave that there and Hopefully everybody's doing well tonight. Uh, I think we got one viewer out there. As you guys jump on, you want to just say who you are and um, how are things going? Hey, Heather, how are you doing tonight? Thanks for being on. Um, yeah, can you hear me okay? Can you let me know how the how is the audio is just one thing I was gonna ask to see. And sorry, I'm looking away from the camera. I'm looking down at the comments. I, still need to find something that can prop up uh, the video um, screen enough for me to see. So Heather, do you mind telling me if you can hear me at all? Yep, okay, perfect. Loud enough too, I suppose, that's good. Um, well, Heather, we are going to give a couple more minutes for people to join, I appreciate it. And um, tonight, like I said, we're gonna be talking about financial overview between business and personal. So we're gonna go through kind of a uh, start contrast against that. So, so we're just going to give it a few more minutes, if that's okay. Not super, super big on the uncomfortable silence, but whatever. So how's the weather, Heather, in uh, South Dakota? You guys got snow still and things? All right. Very cold. That's not good. Yeah, I remember times when we were in the Dakotas. Um, Um, when we were up in North Dakota, like you, uh, we'd have to bring the cat in because it's, uh, oh, it was minus 30. My goodness. Yeah, we used to have to bring Montana, the cats in, or the cat in for a couple of weeks and you'd tear the hell out of the house. So, wow, wow, minus 30. That does not sound good at all. So, wow, okay. Well, I'm glad you can see me and you were able to log on right away, correct? Did you, did you get the alert that I was going live? Because I know there's a couple others that wanted me to wait for them. So I'm just going to wait to see if they come. And if not, oh my gosh. Yeah, I, you, you know, the crazy thing for you guys out there, the crazy thing about the Dakotas, uh, especially where we're from, is literally there's a couple weeks, I tell people this story all the time, there's a couple weeks out of the year where you don't put your pets outside or they'll freeze to death, they'll die. And that's just crazy. That's why there's only a total population between, I think, North Dakota, South Dakota, like 1.3 million people. I mean, there's more, uh, there's more in a lot of metros than there is in two states. Well, throw Montana and Wyoming into that, and I don't even think you get as much uh, people as a population in Indianapolis where I'm at. So, okay. Thanks for that. So, what I'm going to do is we are a couple minutes past, so I'm going to jump right in because I want to make sure that uh, you guys get all of the time and. Um, and the information that I want to give tonight. I know I only have these for a half hour. And I don't expect to um, take, you know, I don't expect to take the entire time. If you guys have anything that you want to ask, please leave it in the comments. And as you jump on, please identify, you know, what your, who you are and just say hi to the group if you can. So what we're going to talk about today is we are going to talk about a financial overview between really when you take a look at business and personal. And what I'm going to do is there are kind of seven key areas uh, in my experience as uh, in business and, and working in the financial industry back in the day um, and still keep up with it that I believe are, are kind of crucial when it comes to planning and just remembering a few key things as we go through life and you know achieve our goals and, and in entrepreneurship and, and small business you know, it's scary. It's a scary thing to do. 
Uh, and it's, a, it's different from what you have to be doing from a personal perspective. So, I mean, the big thing you have to remember is as you go through uh, tonight with me, if you have questions, let me know. I'm going to keep it high, high level. But in the future, if you wanted to discuss any of these with me at all, um, uh, thanks, Susan. Here we go. Susan's on as well. But I mean, if you guys have any questions, um, I do always, as uh, I've said before, I have time that you guys can book using my, um, there's a link in the welcome post uh, that we have. And I'll also post the link uh, in this live uh, towards the end after we're done that if you have anything additional you want to discuss, uh, go ahead and book some time. My calendar is up to date and uh, we will jump on either a phone call or a Zoom call, or whatever you prefer, uh, just to talk a little bit more about maybe some of the questions or concerns you might have, uh, and we'll go from there. So let's jump into this, okay? So the first thing I want you guys to take a look at on the board, and I apologize for always having this board. Uh, it just, to me, I'm a visual learner, and I was actually gonna be a high school math and English teacher back in the day. So for me, it is more of uh, the way that I learn. So if, if this is something that you guys like or dislike, just let me know in the comments as well, and I'll, I'll try and mix it up for, for now. Um, with the trainings, I, I want to make sure that I have some visuals for you guys, even if it's just words, because I like to talk about the topic. But first and foremost, let's talk about taxes. The differences between personal and business taxes. Now, taxes seem like they're a bad word. Uh, you know, nobody likes really paying taxes. Uh, but in a sense, uh, it's uh, kind of one of the, one of the uh, direct things we have to do, you know, as Americans. And it's, it's funny. Uh, it was never supposed to be that way back in the day when it started, but here we are. Uh, we pay taxes on a lot of things in our life. So the difference between personal tax and business tax is on the personal side, if you don't have a small business, if you just are personal, you have what we call a standard deduction or you can itemize. And most folks these days with uh, the standard, at least currently, right? Tax laws, you guys, they change all the time. So first and foremost, disclaimer, I'm not a tax accountant. Um, if you need tax advice, please seek out professional advice. Uh, for me, this is for educational purposes only, and this is around being an entrepreneur and small business compared to uh, personal, and I'm really reflecting on my own personal life, okay? So I just wanna put out that disclaimer. Secondly is, is when you look at taxes, right? So the individual, we pay taxes. A lot of times there's a standard deduction and you can itemize, right? So itemization means that if you have a certain amount of either medical expenses, donations to charity, um, those are the two main ones, uh, or like a really high interest on your mortgage. Uh, if you go over, if those things would add up to over, um, or health expenses, I think I said that, if over what the standard deduction is, you can kind of decide which one you want to take normally. You take the higher of the two, and that's basically what you get to write off for the year. And so that what that does is from a tax perspective, that is like direct expenses that you had that really you can write off so they don't go against your gross tax wages, okay? Secondly though, you can do things inside of like a health insurance, uh, premiums you can pay for out of your paycheck, you can pay for your retirement, uh, you can pay for other pre-tax things that also reduce your overall, what they call adjusted gross income or, or gross taxable amount uh, on the personal side. But other than that, there, there isn't a ton other, a lot that I can think of without going into too much detail. So when you're an entrepreneur or you have a small business, it's just the possibilities expand. And it's, and you shouldn't start a small business, sorry for my giggle there, but you shouldn't start a small business to get to write off. So your taxable amount is, it, it gets lower. You should actually, you know, go into business and the IRS ensures that you go into business to, you know, at least over the course of, I think three to five years, uh, depends on what your business structure is, make a profit, right? Otherwise they classify it as a hobby and then you really don't get to the tax benefits of a small business. But one of the main reasons of a, of a small business that you get is there's the tax benefits with being a sole proprietor versus an LLC are a little different, but in the same sense, you just get to have a little bit of tax relief on when you start up your business for one. And as you go through, there's depreciation, which allows a lot of your expenses to go over the course of time and roll over to years. But there are just a lot of other tax benefits that allow additional write-offs to what you make in your quote unquote full-time job. And you've always heard of entrepreneurs and, and side hustles as they work to make it a full-time gig. There is a lot of tax benefits to that small business side. So just remember that you never start a small business so you can 
you know, just write things off. Some people do, but then they have to like change them out every couple of years. But for the most part, the tax code does allow for a lot more uh, deductions and tax benefits being a small business owner. So just remember that. So secondly, let's talk about insurance. Now, every time I say insurance, a lot of people think, you know, you roll right to, at least from a financial person, life insurance. And, and life insurance is one type of insurance, but the other types of insurance are, you know, your car, your home insurance. But the difference between that is if you own a business, uh, there's similar types of insurance with your business, but there are different tax ramifications with your business insurance. For instance, life insurance on the personal side, uh, your beneficiaries, you know, let's say, regardless if it's term or permanent, uh, your beneficiaries are your direct uh, uh, beneficiaries. I guess they're the ones that get your the payout if you do happen to die. Uh, the second one is with the business, depending on who's paying for that life insurance, um, you know, it can go to a number of different business interests and your beneficiaries are usually, they could be your partner, so on and so forth. So there's a lot more uh, ways that they use insurance when it comes to business. There's what people call infinite banking, but you can do that on, on the personal side as well. Uh, but overall, life insurance is a little different between the two because on the personal side, it normally doesn't get taxed. It normally goes straight to your beneficiary. Non-taxed on the business, it can or may not be taxed. So that's from a life insurance perspective. As it relates to kind of like the personal insurance and the liability insurance, as an entrepreneur, when you're starting out, unless you're having a brick and mortar, uh, in, in my case, it's, it's, it's digital, digital real estate and uh, e-commerce is where I'm at. And uh, you don't require a ton of extra liability insurance because really uh, your customers are exponential and they're all, a lot of them are online. So the people that you help uh, do things uh, are, they're online. So you really don't need that extra, uh, like I think it's bonding insurance and, and things if you had a brick and mortar. So uh, the nice thing about it is you don't have that extra expense with digital entrepreneurship as you would a um, brick and mortar. So that's, that's a little bit about insurance. Uh, you know, your car insurance, your fleet insurance, all those things tend to be similar when it comes to a business. So when you take a look at investments, this is another thing uh, that is, is a little different as it relates to the personal and the business. So the personal, we know that our investments can be what they say qualified or non-qualified, meaning they're pre-tax or post-tax tax investments. You can have uh, vehicles that the pre-tax is normally used for retirement in such a, in like an IRA. Uh, but a lot of times the investments, uh, if, you're, if they are pre-tax, you don't get a ton of those. Uh, but the post-tax, there are a lot of nuances with uh, the personal side. So you should probably work through a financial advisor. But the one thing about those investments that I wanted to say is the objectives for them for personal and business should be about the same. But on the business side, you can exponentiate the investment. So on the personal side, for instance, I use Acorns uh, for one of mine and it's kind of invest your spare change. So it, it actually connects your accounts uh, to uh, the Acorns account and it, it goes into index funds and it really just takes and invests your spare change for you. So that is one of the things that I like because you really set it and forget it. And it's just gonna be extra money that you can use to pay your taxes or anything like that nature. But when it comes to investments for business, uh, you can you know, pay your kids, you can set up SEP IRA accounts, retirement accounts for employees. But when you're by yourself, you don't, when you're a sole proprietor, you're not able to fully maximize uh, a ton of additional best uh, benefits when it comes to investments. Uh, as it relates to how and what investments you should be doing. So let's talk about that for a little bit. When it comes on a personal side, if you are worried about you know, paying taxes on the investments, then I would say stick to more of a retirement investment side. If you're not looking to use any of that uh, investment that you have uh, for immediate use, uh, some people have a small investment account to pay for taxes, some people just don't like their money in savings accounts because of the rates we're getting. But really overall, for the majority of folks, uh, when they think of investments, they think more about, you know, my retirement investment. So um, that would be where I would recommend is pre-tax money, or if you have a Roth IRA, that's probably the best way to do it. Um, the other type of investments are also HSA plans. Those are kind of high deductible uh, plans that have additional uh, funds that you can put them into. And they're 
they almost have like a triple tax benefit because they're pre-tax when you put them in, they're tax-free when you take them out and they roll over. So even if you don't use them for insurance, you can actually use them for like long-term care insurance premiums and things after you reach the age of 65. So that would be another type of investment would be your health savings account investments as well. So next thing I wanna talk about is debt. And I think a lot of people, when you think about this, and I'm just gonna write bad or good. Every time we think about debt, we think of that it's always bad, okay? So debt for the, for the average American consumer anyway is, is, is normally bad. And the thing that I like to talk about debt after I talk about investments is because they kind of ladder, it kind of ladders up. So when you take a look at your debt, the way you can tell if it's good or if it's bad is what of this debt produces money for you. That's kind of what it is. And so for instance, credit cards, right? So let's say you have a, a 10% interest on a credit card and, and you know, uh, on average consumers that put stuff on their credit cards spend 130% of the price. So even if you get this great sale price at JCPenney, like we all know the sale, uh, the sale items, it's on average you spend about 130%. So you spend 30% more, even if it's on sale. So if you get 30% off, you're really buying it for full price if you put it on the credit card on average, right? So credit card debt and stuff as a consumer uh, is, is all bad debt because the, the, the stuff that we, the TVs, the clothes, uh, and, and anything else that we buy like that uh, isn't going to produce any money for us at all, right? So then people might say, well, what about your house? Okay, so house we grow in, we grow equity in, and the, the house is the one that people debate about. Okay, so uh, I would say you're not gonna probably make a ton of money on your house if you look at what you put into it over time and the interest you pay on it over time, even though you get to write it off and things, um, unless you're like you bought it a year ago and, and now you're looking to sell your house, but then you might wanna watch out about the taxes. But from a house perspective, uh, it's a secured asset and it, it's a good thing to have. And a lot of people say it's my most valuable asset. But if you really think about it, there's a real big debate on renting versus buying. And you know, if, if I rented the same type of place that I was in, it would be you know, two and a half times what I pay for it a month. But in the end, I'm, I just put a new garage floor in. I'm doing windows this summer. Uh, you know, when you think about it, it's like how much extra are you putting into that house in order to maintain and keep it? Long term, it's nice to call something your own, but you really need to think about if that house isn't making you money, I'd say it's a break even debt. So I don't know if I'd say it's good or bad, but the place that I'm currently in right now, because I am an entrepreneur and, and small business owner, I will be renting this one out as part of what I'm gonna do from a kind of fishing out of more than one side of the boat is to ensure that I have multiple streams of income coming in. So I, when I'm talking about real estate, I wanna do rentals and I'm getting into that in the, the real near future. Good debt would be just that. It would be debt that makes you money. So small business loans to start out, uh, if you, you know, as long as you continue to uh, exponentiate and pay off and be able to pay off that interest because you can write it off and things like that, but that is good debt. So basically what good debt is, is money that you're borrowing to, uh, make more money, right? So a two to one, even a 1.5 to one. Uh, if I gave you a dollar and you gave me two, how many times would I give you a dollar? If you wanted to borrow a dollar and you gave me back two. So what you want is you want income producing debt is, is basically what it is. I think uh, it was Robert Kiyosaki, I think, who wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, he was speaking once and he said, you know, I have, I have 300 million in debt, but it's all in his assets and it's all producing debt. I think it produced like one and a half times that a year. So um, you, a lot of times you hear people so scared of debt because it's in our money blueprint. Like I grew up super poor and um, you know, not like to where I was homeless and out on the streets or anything, you know, there were people that had it far worse than we did, but you know, it was always, you know, we can't afford that. We can't do this. We can't afford that. And debt, you know, was always uh, listed as a bad thing. And now that I'm a small business owner and entrepreneur, it's like, uh, you just start to look at debt different ways. So I would say the main thing you should look between personal and business debt is does that debt produce income or does it have the potential to produce uh, more than what you put into it? And, and that's the difference to me, at least within good debt and bad debt. 
So let's talk about retirement. Retirement can be seen a, a bunch of different ways. Most of the farmers I used to plan for, their retirement were, was in their assets. Uh, if they wanted to send a kid to college, they'd you know, sell a, an acre of land or a house they had on another section of land or you know, they would uh, lease out uh, some CRP to the government you know, with their land. So everything they had from, and then when they had the retirement, they would just either rent out their land or, or uh, you know, sell it to the kids based on a buy-sell agreement on the business. So retirement to them was, was what they had in their assets and they still did invest a lot and stuff, but what they had worth of assets was, was a lot more. Uh, secondly, you can have pre-tax money, uh, st such as the stuff that goes into IRAs or 401k, 403bs. That's the stuff that also reduces your gross uh, taxable income, okay? And then I would say the post-tax uh, post retirement would be like your Roth IRAs. There are income limits and there are certain amounts that you can put into those every year, but for the most part, uh, Roth IRAs are a, a very decent way to, uh, to invest. So, investment over here, yep, that's good. And, and Susan did bring up a good point. I'm, uh, thanks for the comment, Susan, is like, when you have skin in the game as a small business owner, when you take that good debt to invest in yourself, uh, it, it is a good motivator and it keeps you rolling because you know that over time, if you continue with the proven formula that you know will eventually get you over the edge and be rewarding for you, you're going to, you're going to pay it off five, 10 times over again. So when I talk about estate or assets, we talked about this a little bit for retirement, but, uh, some people like to do paintings. Uh, some people do baseball cards. Uh, even cryptocurrency is considered kind of one of those, what I would call a tan, they call it a tangible asset, even though it's digital currency. Uh, so, but it is taxed more like a house uh, if you sell it right now currently than it is an investment because technically it's not an investment. So your estate basically is what you have underneath you. And I would, I would, I call your estate kind of your net worth. And then that's just what I mean. That's just what assets do you have against your liabilities? So cash flow. Okay. A lot of people look at cash flow as how much money from a personal side do I have in my bank account? and how much does it cost for my bills versus how much my paycheck trading my time for that money comes in how much how much does that come in every month and that's what some people look at cash flow now in a business what you look at cash flow is you look at cash flow from not necessarily a profit loss perspective but you look at how much inflows you have coming in uh, versus how much outflows you have uh, from a business perspective and then it's also days receivable so sometimes on a balance sheet for a business your cash flow is not immediate. It's 30, 60, 90 days out. So there's just a difference when it comes to what cash flow means for a business versus what it means in, uh, inside of your own bank account. Okay. So when you're thinking about being an entrepreneur and if, if you're looking at taking those steps, I just thought this was seven different things that you probably all know about right now uh, on your personal side, or if you are an entrepreneur right now, uh, or you have a small business, uh, which America has tons of them. Uh, these are some things that I could wanted to just refresh for you tonight, give you my view on. But in the end, what I really want you to grab a hold of is how can we ensure that we're achieving our best life? So the first thing is, with from a financial perspective, is is you got to maximize taxes. So maximize, maximize. Sorry. So you want to maximize your taxes. What does that mean? Get with an accountant and get your maximum deduction, whether it's on the personal or on the business side, use a professional here. You guys, I, I mean, I know um, I was a huge TurboTax person for a while, uh, but as I stepped in and that might be fine for some who don't have any deductions at all, the free e-filing that might be fine. But when you are an entrepreneur or when you have a lot of different things going on, uh, make sure you use a tax accountant. And that is the best way to maximize uh, your tax, your tax uh, deductions. And then insurance. The biggest thing I want to talk about on this is we need car insurance because it's a law. House insurance you should probably have because if you do own a house, it is your largest asset, but in, <laughs> in the same, minimizing, you're right, but maximize your deductions. Yeah, Susan, I'm sorry. Late night, um, or it's going to be a late night, I guess, but uh, thanks a lot for that. And um, when you talk about insurance, the biggest thing I would talk about is life insurance. And um, because car and, and home you need, and there's other types of insurance you can buy, but uh, if, you're, if you're a small business owner 
and you don't have a ton of extra liability insurance you have to carry, um, life insurance would be the next one that I would question for you. And there's a big debate over whether you want permanent or whether you have term insurance. And the big thing with permanent insurance is that's just what it is. It's for the rest of your life. Uh, we, there are a few people that say no, buy term and invest the difference until you have the assets that would basically cover uh, if you know you it would happen to pass away and you know your family needed to be taken care of. So my personal view on this is I was always a buy term and invest the difference person until you had assets and you can pay things off uh, and that's still how I am. But now that I mentioned infinite banking to you and, and we won't go into any more detail on that, I'm looking at I'm looking at converting some of what I have in term and taking the option to convert with my insurance company and creating some infinite banking. So do your own research on that, but that would be one thing that I would potentially do permanent insurance for is to use the tax benefits of permanent life insurance to help me maximize my investments. From the investment sides, uh, the one thing that I would, I would caution you on is if you're putting money into these investments right here, but, you ha but you're paying more interest on your bad debt, pay off your bad debt first before you start going crazy on your investments. I mean, with all the hype we have on the crypto market and um, that's, that's, I guess, the latest hype or swing trading or day trading. You know, there are people with a lot of time on their hands at home during the pandemic. So a lot of these marketers came out trying to make a quick buck. And uh, just so you know, like 96% of day traders don't make it. Like to actually have somebody profitable for a long period of time, I mean, those are unicorns. So if you're gonna, don't don't take a crack at day trading. Um, it's, it's not easy, trust me. I thought I would be all awesome at it too during the pandemic. And I did good for some, but then you lose some. And I quickly uh, researched it and found that day traders aren't super successful, especially if you're not using leverage, but that's another story. But pay off your bad debt first, and then find an investment that encompasses your overall goal. So for me, I put my money, uh, my extra money in, um, other than retirement, I put it in what I, what I said was acorns. And I'll leave a link for acorns uh, in this video when we're done. Um, but what acorns is, is it basically invests spare change automatically for you. So let's say I go to the, the grocery store and I buy something for $32.43. It'll round up that other 57 cents and put it into my investment account. And all I'm investing in is, is a moderate, uh, actually I'm a really aggressive portfolio, but it's really index funds. And what index funds are is they're a combination of the entire market in the specific sectors that you want. Um, it's mostly stocks for me, just US stocks. And they have really, really, really low fees. So fees will kill you uh, if you're not careful. So that's what Acorns does. Uh, the fees on Acorns is $3 a month. So unless you're gonna put a little bit into it over the first year, you know, I, I started out with like 20 bucks every, every week just to get 80, $100 into it. But the first year is gonna cost you $36. So when you take a look at that, if you don't have, you know, 500 bucks or so, it's, that's a high percentage. But over time, it's gonna weigh itself out. Take a look if you want to in the link that I'm gonna leave for Acorns and see what you think. Um, but I really like it. I really like it because I don't have to look at it. I don't worry about it. It's spare change. So on average, I'm investing like, seven, eight dollars a week. Um, sometimes when I spend a little more like grocery shopping days, I'll get like, you know, two days of like five bucks each, you know, cause I, I tap it at five dollars and it'll invest it in. But over time, it's just chinking in this basically spare change over time. So it's actually pretty cool. Um, but that's what I would do is I would pay off your bad debt, keep your good debt because that should pay for itself. And then invest in something that you, that's easy for one thing, you understand it a little bit for a second thing and it's mechanism for ensuring that you actually put money away instead of buying that new flat screen TV is there. And that's why I do Acorns because I just don't see it. It comes out just like my retirement. I put a percent in um, and it comes out of the paycheck right away. So, and when you're a small business owner as well, you can do the same thing. You can have automatic deductions come out of your uh, separate IRA, simple IRAs that you make. So between retirement and between these investments, the one thing I would recommend is ensure that A, you have the funds for it by ensuring that your bad debt is gone. And then just make sure it's automatic and it's in something with low fees and tied to a broader market because S&P 500 is outperformed most 
over the past you know, 40 years. That would be my recommendation. Again, this is just for education purposes. From an estate perspective and assets perspective, this is something you need to be thinking about and getting with a financial planner. I would, I would call it a registered investment advisor as you are starting to accumulate some of these because uh, the tax laws on people that have large estates or a lot of assets is pretty decent. And the last thing is from your cash flow. This is something that you should take care of. Uh, remember to have a budget. And then what I would recommend doing is go through and identify wants versus needs. And be honest about this. Be really transparent with yourself about wants and needs because here's the deal. Your wants, that's okay, right? It's okay to have wants every once in a while. But a lot of times we find this merging into with the needs you know you really want that new pair of shoes but do you really need them because you just bought that other pair like two months ago and they normally last seven to eight months if you're really going on them and so i would just say be careful on how you are transparent with your wants and needs but here's one thing you can do and i call it the credit swap take away some of these wants that you have or that you don't really need take some of those away and let's say it's even five to ten dollars you can throw that in your Acorns account every month and just let it go. So eliminate, maybe you buy a Starbucks every day for $5, right? Eliminate one day a week. You got an extra five bucks a week you can put into your Acorns and you just forget about it. Little ways you can do what I call a credit swap. Take some of those wants that you have and some of those things, those desires that you're giving to that you really shouldn't be. And over time, the small amounts really add up, you guys. I would just encourage you to Make sure, you, make sure you're checking your cash flow and make sure it's positive. If it's not positive, get into this and see how you can make it positive and uh, go from there. So I know we're about at time. If you guys have, I don't need more yam, but I really want more yam. <laughs> that is true. That is true. But, you know, when you think about what you're doing with the yarn, though, from a small business perspective, I would call, because of all your knitting, Heather, I would call the yarn... I would call that actually good because you're eventually going to turn that into an awesome product that you do so often that people love and you run out of those things. And uh, so I, I honestly believe you just have uh, to ensure that you're just keeping that, that, that funnel going with people demanding your, your products, just ensuring that you're getting yourself out there a little more. I, I, um, I really love what you do. Yes, it is. It is an investment. And I, I think, you honestly, uh, if you have a chance, share some of your share some of your designs with the group. I think they'd be pretty impressed with uh, your craft of of uh, knitting and, and stuff. And I know it takes a little bit sometimes, but we've talked about scaling it, and and I think it's something you could do. So I don't know that I would feel necessarily bad about um, about the yarn, but uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, I don't want to continue to take up your time on the call, but we'll talk about that. But uh, the yarn is definitely, to me, that's a good investment based on your, your small business that you have. So um, it is, I love them. So yeah, if you have a chance, Heather, um, share, share, with, share with the group some of your, uh, some of your knittings. I love them. And, um, and we'll go from there and, and we'll talk about in subsequent videos uh, or trainings, what I would like to talk about again is just creating demand as uh, when you're an entrepreneur and, and the different avenues that we have to, to market ourselves and things, which is exactly what me and my team uh, help people do. So that's what I was going to get to for my last thing. If you have anything that you have questions with that, you know, you're not going to put in the comments or you aren't really, um, no, I did not see, hold on, let me check the comments. Oh, yeah. So, sorry, Susan, I missed your comment. There were so many coming in. So, uh, Susan asked, she said, whole life, I think you guys can see this, whole life versus term life or the term she's used to. So, whole life and term life, that's permanent insurance is, is whole life. And term insurance is, that's just what it is for a term, 10, 20, 30 years. One is way more expensive than the other because actuarially, for the whole life, they know you're going to have it for your whole life until you die. So, you're, 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 um, Premium is based on just that, you know, how long your mortality tables are and things like that. So when we look at whole life, what I used to tell people is dig a hole and throw your money in it because whole life really is a little more expensive than what Susan pointed out, the universal life. Universal life is 
almost like it's a flexible whole life. The policy uh, is, is a little less expensive because there's not as much guarantees as in a whole life because a whole life grows at a, a certain guaranteed rate. But with the universal life, that's why people use it for infinite banking because you can see that or over, over fund them. And then what happens is, is you have a guaranteed loan amount and growth that those they grow at. So what people do is they'll borrow against this overfunding. So let's say they put 100,000 in. Almost day two, there's probably like 50,000 or 60,000 that they can take a loan against. So what they'll do is take a loan against that and the money, they'll figure out that the money, they, they really never have to pay it back because if you never cancel your life insurance policy and because it's growing at a certain percentage and, and that amount of money left in it will will keep it alive, uh, you never have to pay taxes on that money either. So do your own research on infinite banking. I, if I was, if, if we get far enough into the future and, and we can do a whole session on that, I will. But I worry about that because to me, infinite banking is for folks who have cleared out the, the good, you know, they are definitely done with the bad debt. They've maximized a lot of the investments you can from a business or personal side. Their retirements, you know, they can't do a Roth because their income limits are above it. Uh, and you know what, the, the maximizing taxes and doing everything else. But infinite banking to me is, is the, like the 13th step when it comes to financial freedom. It's, it's awesome, but I would not do that until you're maximizing some of these things here. Or if you have a lump sum that you get inherited, that's when I would do it. Um, but ensure that uh, it, it, to me, it takes a little bit extra coin if you want to truly, truly, truly like use that large sum to fund other things and, and really have infinite banking work. It does take a little bit of coin. So as long as, as, long as everything's rolling, um, but it's not something because the time value of money and compounding interest, it's not something that I would sacrifice your retirement or sacrifice some investments that are going to grow steady over time to try and save up because let's say it takes you five years. You know what the market's done in the last five years? I think it's doubled. You know, so like if you would have been waiting to get enough in your in cash and with the amount of inflation, that's not something I would do. So I would just wait till you have a little, a uh, little more money before you try that. Guaranteed four percent return. Yep. Yeah. So what would happen, Susan, is that since it's got the four percent return, if you borrowed a certain amount, I don't know how much cash value you have in it, but you borrow against that cash value. And they'll tell you like how much you need to pay a month on it in order to keep it alive. And sometimes you, people don't ever really pay it back. So let's say you borrowed a hundred thousand dollars and each month you'd have to pay, you know, 300, $400. What you actually earn from investing it somewhere else will be enough to pay the loan payment that you have from the life insurance plus give you a gain on this side. So that's essentially how infinite making works. It's if you have a guaranteed 4%, so it'll continue to grow. You take a loan against that. They'll tell you you have to pay back this loan for a certain amount a month, but whatever you invested into is going to give you a higher return than that loan payment, and then you get to keep the difference. So I hope that makes sense. There you go. Okay, good. I'm just, I'm sorry I, you caught me off guard a little bit, Susan. I just want to make sure that I explain that kind of as, as best I could on the fly, but if that makes sense to you, then um, hopefully I answered the question. So uh, like I said, I will put the Acorns link in just so you guys can take a look. It's really neat. Um, I really like it, but do some research, let me know what you think. And then also, if you need to book a call to talk to me, uh, there is the booking link up above when you first sign up. And, um, also, uh, I will put the link in the end of this video to book a call. My calendar's up to date. Let's talk. It is not, it is not a sales call, but mo what me and my team does, uh, is we help people with anything that they're facing in their life. Uh, to help them try and achieve their best life, which is what we've done. So um, we've made some drastic changes over the years and I'm, I'm super happy. So I'm, I'm looking to help others get there in regardless of what uh, they're looking at doing. So just go ahead and book a call and uh, we'll go from there. I'll leave that link and the Acorns link after we're done. So is there any other comments? Thank you, Heather, about that. So uh, any other comments before we get off? I know I'm a little over time. I'm like eight minutes over. I'm so sorry. Uh, I know your time's super valuable. Uh, so, okay. You guys, I'm going to sign off. But one last thing, one last thought. Uh, as you think about, uh, you know, investing in yourself and investing in your best life, uh, what I just said, I know your time's valuable. It reminded me of one other thing. Figure out how much your time's worth. 
And this is a really good thing. This is my parting thought for you tonight. Think about how much your time is worth, okay? Think about how much it's worth. Is it worth $50 an hour? Is it worth $100 an hour? How much is it worth? So when you, uh, when you think about whether or not you should be doing a task or paying somebody else to do it, or maybe you're, maybe you're paying for something that you could essentially do for less time, think about what your time is worth and then look at how you're investing that time. Because no matter how much money we have, no matter how much we'll never be able to buy more time. Bill Gates cannot buy more time. Jeff Bezos cannot buy more time. Time's the only thing that's constant and continues to go and you cannot buy more of it. So find out what your time is worth and invest that most important asset of yours, your time properly, okay? So thank you guys very much again. If you have anything, just let me know. Individually contact me and we'll go from there. Look forward to talking to you guys next week, so thanks.